Capit, Part 1 of 3 By Karl Marx Audiobook 52x55 A Letter to Lord John Russell London, 1821 In this pamphlet, the importance of which should have been recognized on account of the term surplus produce or capital, and which Marx saved from being forgotten, we read the following statements. Whatever may be due to the capitalist, from the capitalist standpoint, he can never appropriate more than the surplus labor of the laborer, for the laborer must live. Page 23. As for the way in which the laborer lives and for the quantity of the surplus value appropriated by the capitalist, these are very relative things if capital does not decrease in value in proportion as it increases in volume the capitalist will squeeze out of the laborer the product of every hour of labor above the minimum on which the laborer can live, the capitalist can ultimately say to the laborer, You shall not eat bread, for you can live on beets and potatoes, and this is what we have to come to, page 24. If the laborer can be reduced to living on potatoes, instead of bread, it is undoubtedly true that more can be gotten out of his labor, that is to say, if, in order to live on bread, he was compelled, for his own subsistence and that of his family, to keep for himself the labor of Monday and Tuesday, he will, when living on potatoes, keep only half of Monday's labor for himself, and the other half of Monday, and all of Tuesday, are set free, either for the benefit of the state or for the capitalist. Page 26 it is admitted that the sums of interest paid to the capitalist, either in the form of rent, money interest, or commercial profit, are paid from the labor of others. Page 23 Here we have the same idea of rent which Rod Bertus has, only the writer says interest instead of rent. Marx makes the following comment, Manuscript of a Contribution, etc., page 852. The Little Known Pamphlet Published at a time when the incredible cobbler McCulloch began to be talked about Represents an essential advance over Ricardo It directly designates surplus value or profit in the language of Ricardo, sometimes surplus produce, or interest, as the author of this pamphlet calls it, as surplus labor, which the laborer performs gratuitously which he performs in excess of that quantity of labor required for the reproduction of his labor power, the equivalent of his wages. It was no more important to reduce value down to labor than it is to reduce surplus value, represented by surplus produce, to surplus labor. This had already been stated by Adam Smith, and forms a main factor in the analysis of Ricardo but neither of them said so anywhere clearly and frankly in such a way that it could not be misunderstood. We read furthermore, on page 859 of this manuscript. Moreover, the author is limited by the economic theories which he finds at hand and which he accepts. Just as the confounding of surplus value and profit misleads Ricardo into irreconcilable contradictions, so this author fares by baptizing surplus value with the name of interest of capital. It is true, he advances beyond Ricardo by reducing all surplus value to surplus labor. And furthermore, in calling surplus value interest of capital, he emphasizes that he is referring by this term to the general form of surplus labor as distinguished from its special forms, rent, money interest, and commercial profit but yet he chooses the name of one of these special forms, interest, at the same time for the general form. And this causes his relapse into the economic slang. This last passage fits Rod Bertuz just as if it were made to order for him. He, too, is limited by the economic categories which he finds at hand. He, too, applies the name of one of the minor categories to surplus value, and he makes it quite indefinite at that by calling it rent. The result of these two mistakes is that he relapses into the economic slang, that he makes no attempt to follow up his advance over Ricardo by a critical analysis, and that he is misled into using his imperfect theory, even before it has gotten rid of its eggshells, 
as a basis for a utopia which is in every respect too late. The above-named pamphlet appeared in 1821 and anticipated completely Rodbertu's rent of 1842. This pamphlet is but the farthest outpost of an entire literature which the Ricardian theories of value and surplus value directed against capitalist production in the interest of the proletariat, fighting the bourgeoisie with its own weapons. The entire communism of Owen, so far as it plays a role in economics and politics, is based on Ricardo. Apart from him, there are still numerous other writers, some of whom Marx quoted as early as 1847 in his Poverty of Philosophy against Proudhon, such as Edmonds, Thompson, Hodgkin, etc., etc., and four more pages of E.T. etc. I select from among this large number of writings the following by a random choice. An inquiry into the principles of the distribution of wealth, most conducive to human happiness, by William Thompson, a new edition. London, 1850. This work, written in 1822, first appeared in 1827. It likewise regards the wealth appropriated by the non-producing classes as a deduction from the product of the laborer, and uses pretty strong terms in referring to it. The author says that the ceaseless endeavor of that which we call society consisted in inducing, by fraud or persuasion, by intimidation or compulsion, the productive laborer to perform his labors in return for the minimum of his own product. He asks why the laborer should not be entitled to the full product of his labor. He declares that the compensations, which the capitalists filch from the productive laborer under the name of ground rent or profit, are claimed in return for the use of land or other things. According to him, all physical substances, by means of which the propertyless productive laborer who has no other means of existence but the capacity of producing things, can make use of his faculties, are in the possession of others with opposite material interests, the consent of these is required in order that the laborer may find work, under these circumstances, he says, it depends on the goodwill of the capitalists how much of the fruit of his own labor the laborer shall receive. And he speaks of these defalcations and of their relation to the unpaid product, whether this is called taxes, profit, or theft, etc. I must admit that I do not write these lines without a certain mortification. I will not make so much of the fact that the anti-capitalist literature of England of the 20s and 30s is so little known in Germany, in spite of the fact that Marx referred to it even in his Poverty of Philosophy, and quoted from it, as for instance that pamphlet of 1821, or Ravenstone, Hodgkin, etc., in volume I of Capital but it is a proof of the degradation into which official political economy has fallen, that not only the vulgar economist, who clings desperately to the coattails of Rod Bertuz and really has not learned anything, but also the duly installed professor, who boasts of his wisdom, have forgotten their classical economy to such an extent that they seriously charge Marx with having robbed Rod Bertuz of things which may be found even in Adam Smith and Ricardo. But what is there that is new about Marx's statements on surplus value? How is it that Marx's theory of surplus value struck home like a thunderbolt out of a clear sky, in all modern countries, while the theories of all his socialist predecessors, including Rod Bertus, remained ineffective? The history of chemistry offers an illustration which explains this. Until late in the 18th century, the phlogistic theory was accepted. It assumed that in the process of burning, a certain hypothetical substance, an absolute combustible, named phlogiston, separated from the burning bodies. This theory sufficed for the explanation of most of the chemical phenomena then known, although it had to be considerably twisted in some cases. But in 1774, Priestley discovered a certain kind of air which was so pure, or so free from phlogiston, that common air seemed adulterated in comparison to it. He called it dephlogisticized air. Shortly after him, Sheila obtained the same kind of air in Sweden, 
and demonstrated its existence in the atmosphere. He also found that this air disappeared, whenever some body was burned in it or in the open air, and therefore he called it fire air. From these facts he drew the conclusion that the combination arising from the union of phlogiston with one of the elements of the atmosphere, that is to say by combustion, was nothing but fire or heat which escaped through the glass. Priestley and Sheila had produced oxygen, without knowing what they had discovered. They remained limited by the phlogistic categories which they found at hand. The element, which was destined to abolish all phlogistic ideas and to revolutionize chemistry, remained barren in their hands. But Priestley had immediately communicated his discovery to Lavoisier in Paris, and Lavoisier, by means of this discovery, now analyzed the entire phlogistic chemistry and came to the conclusion that this new air was a new chemical element, that it was not the mysterious phlogiston which departed from a burning body, but that this new element combined with the burning body. Thus he placed chemistry, which had so long stood on its head, squarely on its feet. And although he did not obtain the oxygen simultaneously and independently of the other two scientists, as he claimed later on, he nevertheless is the real discoverer of oxygen as compared to the others who had produced it without knowing what they had found. Marx stands in the same relation to his predecessors in the theory of surplus value that Lavoisier maintains to Priestley and Sheila. The existence of those parts of the value of products, which we now call surplus value, had been ascertained long before Marx. It had also been stated with more or less precision that it consisted of that part of the laborer's product for which its appropriator does not give any equivalent. But there the economists halted. Some of them, for instance the classical bourgeois economists investigated, perhaps, the proportion in which the product of labor was divided among the laborer and the owner of the means of production. Others, the socialists, declared that this division was unjust and looked for utopian means of abolishing this injustice. They remained limited by the economic categories which they found at hand. Now Marx appeared. And he took an entirely opposite view from all his predecessors. What they had regarded as a solution, he considered a problem. He saw that he had to deal neither with deflogisticized air, nor with fire air, but with oxygen. He understood that it was not simply a matter of stating an economic fact, or of pointing out the conflict of this fact with eternal justice and true morals, but of explaining a fact which was destined to revolutionize the entire political economy, and which offered a key for the understanding of the entire capitalist production, provided you knew how to use it. With this fact for a starting point Marx analyzed all the economic categories which he found at hand just as Lavoisier had analyzed the categories of the phlogistic chemistry which he found at hand. In order to understand what surplus value is, Marx had to find out what value is. Therefore he had above all to analyze critically the Ricardian theory of value. Marx also analyzed labor as to its capacity for producing value, and he was the first to ascertain what kind of labor it was that produced value, and why it did so and by what means it accomplished this. He found that value was nothing but crystallized labor of this kind, and this is a point which Rod Bertuz never grasped to his dying day. Marx then analyzed the relation of commodities to money and demonstrated how, and why, thanks to the imminent character of value, commodities and the exchange of commodities must produce the opposition of money and commodities. His theory of money, founded on this basis, is the first exhaustive treatment of this subject, and it is tacitly accepted everywhere. He analyzed the transformation of money into capital and demonstrated that this transformation is based on the purchase and sale of labor power. By substituting labor power, as a value-producing quality, for labor he solved with one stroke one of the difficulties which caused the downfall of the Ricardian school, viz. The impossibility of harmonizing the mutual exchange of capital and labor with the Ricardian law of determining value by labor. By ascertaining the distinction between constant and variable capital, 
he was enabled to trace the process of the formation of surplus value in its details and thus to explain it, a feat which none of his predecessors had accomplished. In other words, he found a distinction inside of capital itself with which neither Rod Bertuz nor the capitalist economists know what to do, but which nevertheless furnished a key for the solution of the most complicated economic problems, as is proved by this Volume 2 and will be proved still more by Volume 3. He furthermore analyzed surplus value and found its two forms, absolute and relative surplus value. And he showed that both of them had played a different, and each time a decisive role, in the historical development of capitalist production. On the basis of this surplus value he developed the first rational theory of wages which we have, and drew for the first time an outline of the history of capitalist accumulation and a sketch of its historical tendencies. And Rod Bertus? After he has read all that, he regards it as an assault on society, and finds that he has said much more briefly and clearly by what means surplus value is originated, and finally declares that all this does indeed apply to the present form of capital, that is to say to capital as it exists historically, but not to the conception of capital, that is to say, not to the utopian idea which Rod Bertus has of capital. He is just like old Priestley, who stood by phlogiston to the end and refused to have anything to do with oxygen. There is only this difference. Priestley had actually produced oxygen, while Rod Bertus had merely rediscovered a common place in his surplus value, or rather his rent, and Marx declined to act like Lavoisier and to claim that he was the first to discover the fact of the existence of surplus value. The other economic feats of Rod Bertus were performed on about the same plane. His elaboration of surplus value into a utopia has already been inadvertently criticized by Marx in his Poverty of Philosophy. What may be said about this point in other respects, I have said in my preface to the German edition of that work. Rod Bertus' explanation of commercial crises out of the underconsumption of the working class has been stated before him by Sismondi in his Nouveau Principes de l'Economie Politique, Liv. 4, ch. 4. However, Sismondi always had the world market in mind, while the horizon of Rod Bertus does not extend beyond Prussia. His speculations as to whether wages are derived from capital or from income belong to the domain of scholasticism and are definitely settled by the third part of this second volume of capital. His theory of rent has remained his exclusive property and may rest in peace, until the manuscript of Marx criticizing it will be published. Finally his suggestions for the emancipation of the old Prussian landlords from the oppression of capital are entirely utopian for they avoid the only practical question, which has to be solved, viz. How can the old Prussian landlord have a yearly income of, say, 20,000 marks and a yearly expense of, say, 30,000 marks, without running into debt? The Ricardian school failed about the year 1830, being unable to solve the riddle of surplus value. And what was impossible for this school? remained still more insoluble for its successor, vulgar economy. The two points which caused its failure were these. Labor is the measure of value. However, actual labor in its exchange with capital has a lower value than labor embodied in the commodities for which actual labor is exchanged. Wages, the value of a definite quantity of actual labor are always lower than the value of the commodity produced by this same quantity of labor and in which it is embodied. The question is indeed insoluble, if put in this form. It has been correctly formulated by Marx and then answered. It is not labor which has any value. As an activity which creates values it can no more have any special value in itself than gravity can have any special weight, heat any special temperature electricity any special strength of current. It is not labor which is bought and sold as a commodity, but labor power. As soon as labor power becomes a commodity, its value is determined by the labor embodied in this commodity as a social product. 
This value is equal to the social labor required for the production and reproduction of this commodity. Hence the purchase and sale of labor power on the basis of this value does not contradict the economic law of value. According to the Ricardian law of value, two capitals employing the same and equally paid labor, all other conditions being equal, produce the same value and surplus value, or profit, in the same time. But if they employ unequal quantities of actual labor, they cannot produce equal surplus values, or, as the Ricardians say, equal profits. Now in reality, the exact opposite takes place. As a matter of fact, equal capitals, regardless of the quantity of actual labor employed by them, produce equal average profits in equal times. Here we have, therefore, a clash with the law of value, which had been noticed by Ricardo himself, but which his school was unable to reconcile. Rodbertus likewise could not but note this contradiction. But instead of solving it, he made it a starting point of his utopia, Zurerkengnis, etc. Marx had solved this contradiction even in his manuscript for his Critique of Political Ecomony. According to the plan of capital, this solution will be made public in Volume 3. Several months will pass before this can be published. Hence those economists, who claim to have discovered that Rod Bertuz is the secret source and the superior predecessor of Marx, have now an opportunity to demonstrate what the economics of Rod Bertuz can accomplish. If they can show in which way an equal average rate of profit can and must come about, not only without a violation of the law of value, but by means of it, I am willing to discuss the matter further with them. In the meantime, they had better make haste. The brilliant analyses of this volume too and its entirely new conclusions on an almost untilled ground are but the initial statements preparing the way for the contents of Volume 3, which develops the final conclusions of Marx's analysis of the social process of reproduction on a capitalist basis. When this Volume 3 will appear, little mention will be made of a certain economist called Rodbertus. The second and third volumes of Capital were to be dedicated, as Marx stated repeatedly, to his wife. Friedrich Engels London, on Marx's birthday, May 5, 1885 The present second edition is, in the main, a faithful reprint of the first. Typographical errors have been corrected, a few inconsistencies of style eliminated, and a few short passages containing repetitions struck out. The third volume, which presented quite unforeseen difficulties, is likewise almost ready for the printer. If my health holds out, it will be ready for the press this fall. Friedrich Engels London, July 15, 1893 Translator's Note The conditions and the location of the place in which I translated volumes 2 and 3 of this work made it impossible for me to get access to the original works of the authors quoted by Marx. I was compelled, under these circumstances, to retranslate many quotations from English authors from the German translation, without an opportunity to compare my retranslated version with the English original. But whatever may be the difference in the wording of the originals and of my retranslation from the German, it does not affect the substance of the quotations in the least. The meaning of the originals will be found to be the same as that of my retranslation. The interpretation given by Marx to the various quotations from other authors, and the conclusions drawn by him from them, are not altered in the least by any deviation, which my translation may show from the original texts. If anyone should be inclined to turn these statements of mine to any controversial advantage, he should remember that he cannot use them against Marx, but only against me. Ernest Unterman Book 2 The Circulation of Capital Part I The Metamorphoses of Capital and Their Cycles Chapter I The Circulation of Money Capital the circulation process of capital takes place in three stages, which, according to the presentation of the matter in Volume I, form the following series. First Stage 
The capitalist appears as a buyer on the commodity and labor market, his money is transformed into commodities, or it goes through the circulation process MC. Second stage. Productive consumption of the purchased commodities by the capitalist. He acts in the capacity of a capitalist producer of commodities, his capital passes through the process of production. The result is a commodity of more value than that of the elements composing it. Third stage. The capitalist returns to the market as a seller, his commodities are exchanged for money, or they pass through the circulation process CM. Hence the formula for the circulation process of money capital is MC P CM, the dots indicating the points where the process of circulation was interrupted and C and M designating C and M increased by surplus value. The first and third stages were discussed in volume I only in so far as it was required for an understanding of the second stage, the process of production of capital. For this reason, the various forms which capital assumes in its different stages, and which it either retains or discards in the repetition of the circulation process, were not considered. These forms are now the first objects of our study. In order to conceive of these forms in their purest state, we must first of all abstract from all factors which have nothing to do directly with the discarding or adopting of any of these forms. It is therefore taken for granted at this point that the commodities are sold at their value and that this takes place under the same conditions throughout. Abstraction is likewise made of any changes of value which might occur during the process of circulation. First Stage MC MC represents the exchange of a sum of money for a sum of commodities, the purchaser exchanges his money for commodities, the sellers exchange their commodities for money. It is not so much the form of this act of exchange which renders it simultaneously a part of the general circulation of commodities and a definite organic section in the independent circulation of some individual capital, as its substance, that is to say the specific use values of the commodities which are exchanged for money. These commodities represent on the one hand means of production, on the other labor power, and these objective and personal factors in the production of commodities must naturally correspond in their peculiarities to the special kind of articles to be manufactured. If we call labor power L, and the means of production PM, the sum of commodities to be purchased is C equals L plus PM, or more briefly C. MC, considered as to its substance, is therefore represented by MC, that is to say MC is composed of ML and MPM. The sum of money M is separated into two parts, one of which buys labor power, the other means of production. These two series of purchases belong to entirely different markets, the one to the commodity market proper, the other to the labor market. Aside from this qualitative division of the sum of commodities into which M is transformed, the formula MC also represents a very characteristic quantitative relation. We know that the value, or price, of labor power is paid to its owner, who offers it for sale as a commodity, in the form of wages, that is to say it is the price of a sum of labor containing surplus value. For instance, if the daily value of labor power is equal to the product of five hours labor valued at three shillings, this sum figures in the contract between the buyer and seller of labor power as the price, or wages, for say, 10 hours of labor time. If such a contract is made, for instance, with 50 laborers, they are supposed to work 500 hours per day for their purchaser, and one half of this time, or 250 hours equal to 25 days of labor of 10 hours each, represent nothing but surplus value. The quantity and the volume of the commodities to be purchased must be sufficient for the utilization of this labor power. MC, then, does not merely express the qualitative relation represented by the exchange of a certain sum of money, say £422 sterling, for a corresponding sum of means of production and labor power, but also a quantitative relation between certain parts of that same money spent for the labor power L and the means of production PM. 
This relation is determined at the outset by the quantity of surplus labor to be expended by a certain number of laborers. If, for instance, a certain manufacturer pays a weekly wage of £50 sterling to 50 laborers, he must spend £372 sterling for means of production, if this is the value of the means of production which a weekly labor of 3,000 hours, 1,500 of which are surplus labor, transforms into factory products. It is immaterial for the point under discussion, how much additional value in the form of means of production is required in the various lines of industry by the utilization of surplus labor. We merely emphasize the fact that the amount of money M spent for means of production in the exchange MPM must buy a proportional quantity of them. The quantity of means of production must suffice for the absorption of the amount of labor which is to transform them into products. If the means of production were insufficient, the surplus labor available for the purchaser would not be utilized, and he could not dispose of it. On the other hand, if there were more means of production than available labor, they would not be saturated with labor and would not be transformed into products. As soon as the process MC has been completed, the purchaser has more than simply the means of production and labor power required for the manufacture of some useful article. He has also at his disposal a greater supply of labor power, or a greater quantity of labor than is necessary for the reproduction of the value of this labor power, and he has at the same time the means of production required for the materialization of this quantity of labor. In other words, he has at his disposal the elements required for the production of articles of a greater value than these elements, he has a mass of commodities containing surplus value. The value advanced by him in the form of money has then assumed a natural form in which it can be incarnated as a value generating more value. In brief, value exists then in the form of productive capital which has the faculty of creating value and surplus value. Let us call capital in this form P. Now the value of P is equal to that of L and PM, it is equal to M exchanged for L and PM. M is the same capital value as P, only it has a different form of existence, it is capital value in the form of money. Money capital. MC, or the more general formula MC, a sum of purchases of commodities, a process within the general circulation of commodities, is therefore at the same time, seeing that it is a stage in the independent circulation of capital, a process of transforming capital value from its money form into its productive form. It is the transformation of money capital into productive capital. In the diagram of the circulation which we are here discussing, money appears as the first bearer of capital value, and money capital therefore represents the form in which capital is advanced. Money in the form of money capital finds itself employed in the functions of a medium of exchange. In the present case it performs the service of a general purchasing medium and general paying medium. The last named service is required inasmuch as labor power, though first bought is not paid until it has been utilized. If the means of production are not found ready on the market, but have to be ordered, money in the process MPM likewise serves as a paying medium. These functions are not due to the fact that money capital is capital, but that it is money. On the other hand, money capital, or capital value in the form of money, cannot perform any other service but that of money. This service appears as a function of capital simply because it plays a certain role in the movements of capital. The stage in which this function is performed is interrelated with other stages of the circulation of money capital. Take, for instance, the case with which we are here dealing. Money is here exchanged for commodities which represent the natural form of productive capital, and this form contains in the germ the phenomena of the process of capitalist production. A part of the money performing the function of money capital in the process MC assumes, in the course of this circulation, a function in which it loses its capital character but preserves its money character. The circulation of money capital M is divided into the stages MPM and ML into the purchase of means of production and of labor power. 
let us consider the last named stage by itself. ML is the purchase of labor power by the capitalist. It is also the sale of labor power, or we may say of labor, since we have assumed the existence of wages, by the laborer who owns it. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.